good start. Right, hello. Uh, um, welcome to hearing some myths being busted. We all like to bust a good myth. And there are many in the electric vehicle world. So to help me bust some myths, please welcome to the stage our three panelists. Uh, we have Evie Martel from Changemaster, um, Matthew Travas I, Travaskis. I asked him, and I can't read my own writing the second time round from the Renewable Energy Association, uh, and Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield from Transport Evolved Podcast, who I'm sure you know. Please welcome them. We, we all know, I guess if you're here, you all know that we've probably all spoken to friends and relatives and colleagues about electric vehicles, and some of the same questions and issues keep coming up. There are some very persistent myths in the electric vehicle world. So what I'm going to do first of all is ask each of our panelists for their most, the myth, because you have to be nice when people ask because they are reasonable questions, but the myth that they, they just go, oh, every time it's asked because it keeps coming up. So each of you, have you got your, your thing that really is a bee in your bonnet? Who's going to tell us about their bee first? Evie, perhaps your bee I'll first. I'll go for it. Yep, no problem. So just being here for the last four hours, I've probably heard this about five times, that the infrastructure isn't good enough. So I always, my first question is, where, where did you get that fact? Or, or why do you not think it's good enough? And the answer is never very solid. Um, so we've got about 15,000 public charging points in the UK so far. Um, and that's across various different networks, and they're all pay-as-you-go accessible. Um, our network, Polar, has 6,500 charge points. So to put this in perspective, that's about 45% of the network. Um, at any one time, so the maximum time our charge points are used at the same time is about 1,300. So that's about 20% of our network is the maximum it's ever used. So there's 80% of the network absolutely free to use. So that's kind of my bugbear, that one. Okay, Nikki, how about you? What's your bee in your bonnet? Oh, that's a really tough one because I've got so many. The one that, that, that always makes me laugh the most is, oh, yeah, but you have to replace the batteries every two years because they're going to run out and then you're going to be stuck. And then I can't afford £10 million for a new battery pack for my electric car and my diesel engine runs forever. Yes. So... And how do you respond to that? And I normally say, um, okay, so, you know, your mobile phone, your battery probably lasts longer than the phone when you're using it. You know, if you are an Apple fan and you change your phone every year, your battery is probably still fine when you switch the phone. And the same thing is true for the cars. 90% of all electric cars on the road today will probably continue to use the original battery pack that they came with until the day they are scrapped or written off or something else. And recycled. We're going for recycled. Or recycled, yes. They're looking pretty good. Okay, Matthew, what is your chief bee in your bonnet? I think it actually relates in, in, in a way to the first two, and, and it's the idea of range. It's the fact that until I can buy an EV that can do 500 miles on a charge um, and then recharge in 10 minutes, it's not for me. So the idea that it has to be on a par with the, the experience of, of fueling a conventional car. I once, I once did 2,200 miles in two weeks in a BMW i3, which surprised everyone, myself included. Um, and so I just used an i3 in the way that most people would use a 3 Series Retmobile. So you can actually do those kind of miles. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's the norm, but that uh, Nikki, also ties back to battery and yeah. charging. I want everybody in the audience to uh, give me an indication of how far they travel on a daily basis to work and all of your driving, that means taking the kids to school, doing your shopping trips, whatever, is less than 10 miles a day. Put your hands up. Okay, so you guys there, you could own a Nissan Leaf, a 30 kilowatt hour Nissan Leaf, not even a 40 kilowatt hour, so the previous generation Leaf, you could charge that once a week. Who drives more than 50 miles in a day? All right, congratulations. You can still drive a Nissan Leaf every day. You still have 50 miles left at the end of the day. You just have to charge it every night. Yeah, so I think that's another myth that home charging is expensive, but the government has definitely helped with that with their 500 pound grant. So charges from places like us, Chargemaster, £279. Um, and that's the, about 80% of charging is done overnight. 
at people's home and it's the easiest way to charge. And it's just like plugging a mobile phone in. Who drives more than 75 miles every single day on average? So what's that as a percentage? Do we have any mathematicians in the room, Helen? Oh, a highly accurate estimate says it's about 1%. 1%. So for 99% of you all there, you could drive a cheap, I'm not talking Tesla, I'm talking cheap electric car every single day and not have to worry about it. Now, let's see how many of you actually own an electric car. Put your hands up. I think a few. Well, So about well, half of call. the people yeah. who put their hands up and said they drove a distance that a leaf could, could manage don't own one. So that's a myth busted right there. Should we? Let's talk about charging and range anxiety for the longer journeys, as you were saying. The journey, you know, it's once or twice a year you go and visit your relative at the other end of the country. So you talked a little bit about this. So you said how many charges there are. You didn't say anything about how they're distributed. Because obviously, you know, I live in London. Actually, I cycle everywhere. I feel I shouldn't admit that in an electric car hall. <laughs> but it's fine, you know, what if half of all your charges are in London and, and I'm going to see someone in Cornwall. What's the distribution of your charges like? Yeah, so, well, we're nationwide, so we've got 6,500 charge points, and that's from Cornwall up to Scotland. We've got the Charge Pay Scotland uh, network up there as well. Um, and every single charge point that is going in the ground is ad hoc accessible, so you don't need a membership. We do have a membership, so our members, we've got about 15,000 of them, and hopefully some of them are here. Um, they get cheap charging, and it's just as cheap as charging at home overnight. But if you do want to rock up and just use a charger, you can either use contactless on some of our newer chargers or with an app, and it's as easy as that, and you can just get going. But how far, I mean, are there some places where there are not very many chargers? You know, if you're in the middle of... Wales. Wales. Yeah, I've heard that one about 10 times today, so thank you for everyone <laughs> that's mentioning Wales. Um, yeah, so well, we, we basically have a program at the moment where we install charge points for free at hotels, restaurants, gyms, motorway service areas, basically to make sure our network is as sustainable as possible and to have full coverage across the UK. So if anyone knows any sites, then please do let us know. But we are definitely working on Mid-Wales. We've got one going in next week in Mid-Wales, which I think will make a lot of people very happy. Um, but yeah, we're, we're always looking for new sites. Well, our membership is 7 85 a month, and then it's nine pence per kilowatt hour. So we want to make sure that people can charge. And there's a lot of people out there now going into electric cars that can't home charge, which I think is another myth that we should cover in a minute, that you need to have a garage or off-street parking to have an electric car. We have a lot of members that purely rely on public networks. Um, and when it is pay-as-you-go, obviously, we need to be installing these. And, and no, we don't take any public money for our new charge points. It's all fully private. Um, and so, obviously, it's, it's a bit like a kind of coffee. If, if you want to get a coffee away from home, then it's going to cost you slightly more. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I'm, I'm just bringing up here, I've got an app on my phone. People also say that it's, it's costly to drive electric cars using public charging stations and make long-distance trips. I recently made a trip from Reno, Nevada to Portland, Oregon, where I live. It's about, it was about 610 miles using the route I had to use to take in the two or three rapid charges that I needed to stop at. It was about 15 pounds to drive 610 miles. I don't think you could do that in a petrol car. Okay, so that's another myth busted. Right, Matthew, I want to ask you about something which you hear a lot, which is like, well, all this is fine now because there are not many people driving electric cars, but as soon as more people own cars, if everyone plugs into the grid at the same time, it's all going to collapse in a heap and go wrong. It, it could do. Um, I think we need to... There are already discussions around how we, we manage this transition. Um, local network operators, so um, uh, the distribution network operators, are starting to get a little bit worried about the clustering effects. So a neighbour of mine bought an EV because I had one. I know there's another one in the next street that I think is on the same transformer. That's not a problem. But if the entire street decided that they wanted to go and, and get an EV, we could have an issue. So, but longer term, um, you know, we're looking at how we're going to mitigate that. Um, we already, I mean, Nikki indicated that um, a lot of the room could actually not have to charge their car every night. So also that opens up that not everyone necessarily would be charging at home. They could be charging at work in the daytime or using public charging points. Anyway, one thing, obviously, from the Renewable Energy Association is we want to ensure that as much of the energy as possible is coming from renewable sources. The other criticism we hear a lot is, surely we're just displacing the pollution somewhere else. 
ultimately, EVs will help the grid run more efficiently, especially if we can move them to charge when the grid is lightly loaded. There is masses of capacity in the generation um, capacity of the, of the UK overnight to charge vehicles, which is usually when we're asleep anyway, so there won't be an issue. But we do need to be careful about avoiding the peak from 4 p.m. to 7-ish in the evening, when we're in, especially in winter, when we're all cooking dinner as well. Um, a lot of people that are charging with a three-pin plug, the natural thing to do when you get home at five o'clock, plug the car in and, and set it charging. Even if you don't have a tariff that lets you have a cheaper charge overnight, if you want to be friendlier to the grid, just set that charge timer function to charge during the night instead of in the evening. And pretty much every electric car on the market today has a charge timer in it. The exception is the Renault Twizy. So let's just, so obviously there's a lot of myths around charging, um, but let's move on a little bit and just talk about one of the other myths, which is that electric cars are not very reliable, which, you know, we do, people still have this, but we've definitely, there are people here, I have heard the stories of people who had one 10 or 12 years ago and uh, Nikki was just talking about pushing one up a hill, right? There is still this perception that they're not quite as reliable. Uh, I've uh, probably driven 200, maybe 300,000 miles in electric cars. I've only suffered three times where I've had to call out a breakdown service and one time when I had to call a friend to help me out. And the one time... I had a friend help me out was because I had done something wrong to the car. It was a car I had half built and I'd not tightened something up and it had fallen off. So that doesn't count. The other three times were because I had a flat tire. Um, and Matthew, you've been driving electric cars for many years. What, uh, what's your experience of you know, maintaining them and, and reliability? I think if we, if we were sitting here um, celebrating uh, the, the introduction, the invention, the adoption of, of this newfangled internal combustion engine vehicle, because we'd all already been driving EVs, we'd look at the combustion engine and go, so we've got about a thousand reciprocating parts that all need to be oiled critically, otherwise it'll all fail spectacularly. We would never do it. It would never get off the ground. Um, it's, it's almost fear of the unknown. There are so few moving parts in an electric vehicle. That, that's where its strength lies. People are, have been, um, very worried about battery longevity, battery reliability. Um, even though most new vehicles on the market now get an eight-year, 100,000-mile warranty, there's a few exceptions to that. Um, but that shows that you know very, very few vehicles globally, and when we look at the sort of volume brands like the Nissan Leaf, the BMW i3, it's literally a handful of cars that have had to have batteries replaced for, for any kind of failure. So overall, um, also when you get round to your, your kind of annual servicing costs, you know, don't overpay to get your EV serviced because pretty much the only thing they're going to replace is the pollen filter. It's for us the soft squidgy bit behind the wheel, not not the car itself. Yeah, and on off the back of that, um, Chevrolet is notorious in the States for having cars that are not that reliable. Chevys are, they're nice cars, but they, they do require a lot of TLC sometimes. The Chevrolet Bolt, that's their first electric car, mass production electric car, is their most reliable car. Would anybody like to guess why? It's because it doesn't have an internal combustion engine. We were talking a little bit before about this idea that, you know, we often talk about charging overnight. And charging overnight, if you're at home, implies that you can plug it in at your home. Now, I live in a, an apartment in London, which is five stories up, and there's no, like, I can't, I couldn't charge an electric car at my home. But that is not a game. It's not, it's not a deal breaker, is no, it? And I'm in exactly the same situation. I live in a, a block of flats with no off-street parking. So I'm lucky that my workplace provides charge points, which if you haven't got an electric car, make sure you, you ask your employer. You might as well ask. And it is a duty of them to, if they are put, at least putting you in a company car that's a plug-in hybrid, they should be providing charging as well for it. There are also workplace charging grants from the government. So it's, again, fairly affordable for a workplace. And obviously, they'll be, you'll be saving money in the long term, especially if it's a company car. So kind of works all, always, and the green credentials of the company are, are better. I think the, uh, an experience I had just over a, a year ago, um, I was loaned one of the, the then new generation Renault Zoe's with a 40 kilowatt hour battery pack. Um, and I'm based down in Cornwall normally. And um, which is not a bad place to use an EV. 
Um, and I was told, yeah, okay, well, you can borrow a Zoe for a week, try it out, and see what you think. Um, yeah, just one thing, can you pick it up? Or, well, where? West London? And I'm, yeah, all right. And, and just didn't think twice about it. Having driven it down to Cornwall, and there was plenty of infrastructure to get it there, um, and I don't mind admitting this either, um, once I charged it that first night, I had 180 miles worth of range. Now, I'm lucky enough to have charging at my office as well, but I got to the office, oh, I don't need to plug it in. Got home, oh, I don't need to plug it in. Did a 50-mile round trip to go and see family. I still don't need to plug it in. And I didn't charge it for the whole week until the night before I had to drive it back to London. And it's the first time I've done a lengthy trip without, you know, getting crib notes, maps, plotting, and, you know, kind of getting the protractor out. So and it's plenty of ways to manage without charging at home every yeah. night. So I am getting little signals that very subtly suggest that we may have reached the end of our allotted time. So please join me in thanking our three fabulous panelists, Evie, Nikki, and Matthew.